Welcome back to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular Podcast Series, Interviews with the Experts. I'm your host, Dr. Sharon Hayes. I'm a non-invasive cardiologist and vice chair of faculty development and academic advancement for the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine here in Rochester, Minnesota. And today I'm joined by Dr. Katie Young, who's an assistant professor of medicine and director of our cardio OB clinic here at Mayo in Rochester. And today our, our topic is valve disease in pregnancy. Um, Dr. Young is going to share with us the medical management of native valvular heart disease in pregnancy, highlighting the importance of specialized care through a pregnancy heart team approach. But the reason we really need to cover this is the rising mortality rates in the U.S. for pregnant people. Um, and cardiovascular disease is really a big issue. So, Katie, how common is this, particularly the valve disease? And why is it important for our audience, who may be general cardiologists or internists, to and not specialists, and maybe don't take care of a lot of pregnant women? Yes. First, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. And I totally agree with what you've said that this is an overall an extremely important topic as we know maternal mortality rates in the U.S. Are, are high and increasing. And when we look at the causes of maternal mortality, cardiac disease is the leading cause. And while we know that we have a population of patients with congenital heart disease, we also know that acquired heart disease conditions um, are common and Generally speaking, about one in one to four percent of pregnancies will have some cardiac disease, um, and valve disease is one subset of those which we'll cover today. So, um, why don't you start by sharing some of the physiologic changes of pregnancy, and then how that is going to affect women who have known known or pers- possibly unknown, and I think we should yes. talk that um, the diagnosis yep. of valvular heart disease that that presents for the first time, but but yep. what are the physiologic changes of a normal pregnancy and how does that affect our valves? So during a normal pregnancy, we see an increase in blood volume. There's an increase in cardiac output and an increase in heart rate. Along with that, we also see a decrease in systemic vascular resistance or a decrease in afterload. So essentially, we have an increase in preload and a decrease in afterload through pregnancy. And normally, uh, this is very well tolerated in pregnancy. But in certain patients, these hemodynamic changes can uh, result in decompensation or, as you mentioned, can actually unmask um, or cardiac disease in pregnancy. And, you know, to your point you made, it's extremely important to take symptoms, cardiac symptoms during a pregnancy uh, and evaluate them appropriately. So dyspnea, uh, chest pain, edema, and it can be extremely challenging because it overlaps with normal uh, symptoms of particularly late stage pregnancy. Uh, but that is why, you know, having a high index of suspicion, knowing that we we do see women present with cardiac disease for the first time in pregnancy. And Um, also to highlight that for those with known disease. So if you're following a patient who's younger and has aortic stenosis or mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation, you some valvular disease, it's a opportunity for us to provide preconception counseling. And I discussed that in a separate podcast, but this is a patient population where really benefits from that discussion about pregnancy, asking those questions about family planning so that we can best serve uh, those individuals. So, you know, I think what the the point you make is that preconception planning, if you know you have a bicuspid aortic valve or have mitral stenosis, um, I think the, the emphasis is when that patient is ready, she should talk to a cardiologist and her heart team about what she needs to do in advance. And obviously, yeah. you know, it's, it's probably beyond the scope to talk about all the anticoagulation and the meds, but mm-hmm. obviously mm-hmm. many of these patients may be on medications that would be relatively or absolutely contraindicated. And absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely important. Mm-hmm. So who are the women with and what valve um, conditions, uh, lesions are the ones we need to worry most about. Yes. So there are some that we should remember that are highest risk. So there's a range. Um, I tend to use the modified WHO risk classification scoring system that helps us risk stratify 
uh, individuals with cardiac disease that want to have pregnancies. And generally speaking, stenotic lesions are less tolerant of these hemodynamic changes than regurgitant valvular lesions. And um, so severe mitral stenosis and severe symptomatic aortic valve stenosis are considered modified WHO risk class four, which is the highest risk group. And and the, and with the recommendation there should be that they defer or avoid pregnancy, speak to their cardiologist and their valve specialist, and likely well they need an intervention prior to then considering a pregnancy. So those are the highest risk, I think, native valve lesions. Yeah, and I, and I think most of those are probably known, um, yes. particularly in the U.S. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so talk about general medical management and recommendations for those with mitral stenosis, my, aortic stenosis, what you just talked about, those higher risk lesions. Mm-hmm. So for those that aren't severe or you know, don't require an intervention, but you know that they're, they're still at elevated risk um, for pregnancy and, and big things we think about so let's talk about mitral stenosis. So with mitral stenosis, um, big things we worry about are arrhythmias and heart failure. And so because of those physiologic changes, there's an increase in heart rate and increase in output. We know that valve gradients will go up. So we follow them with echo. We expect to see valve uh, gradients go up with this increased flow, increased heart rate. And really the mainstay of management is going to be going to be heart rate control and volume control. So I utilize beta blockers and sometimes digoxin through pregnancy to help control the heart rate, remembering that we see an increase through pregnancy and that we might need to increase the dose based on their symptoms as as that individual gets later stage into their pregnancy. Diuretics can be used also safely in pregnancy with monitoring. Um, And so these are medications that are safe and can be utilized. And it really is just making sure that they're followed at a center that is comfortable caring for this patient population and can see them, you know, periodically in conjunction with maternal fetal medicine. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to... Can you give me an example of like just the frequency that the cardiologist sees, say, a patient with mild to moderate mitral stenosis? Because obviously they've got their OB schedule. And mm-hmm. um, what what's the cardiology schedule? Yep. So it will depend on the severity and symptoms, of course. But I would say, generally speaking, they're going to see cardiology at least once a trimester. But in the particularly mitral stenosis where you're more moderate um, or if there's more symptoms, you may be seeing them perhaps every four to six weeks even sometimes, uh, depending on symptoms because of the changes that are happening, particularly as they hit that late second, early third trimester. So later in pregnancy, you may see them more, more frequently. So you were going to start on uh, aortic stenosis. Yeah. Yes. Aortic stenosis is quite honestly, very similar. Um, the, you know, really there we're working again on monitoring their volume, um, making sure um, if they need any diuretics, and then if they develop any arrhythmias, making sure we treat those appropriately. Um, but really kind of similar otherwise. I do want to just also comment with the mitral stenosis with the arrhythmia piece. So particularly someone with rheumatic mitral valve disease, we really want to have our um, alert for something like atrial fibrillation. Arrhythmias are common in pregnancy. And so if they develop that, um, and sometimes I'll even do a Holter screening, you know, through the trimesters, if they're otherwise asymptomatic, uh, it would change our management and we need to initiate anticoagulation. So we've we've talked about native valve and um, and some of these patients, because they had atrial fibrillation uh, in the past, um, we can't go into details, but but uh, about that, because that's a whole talk, that's a whole podcast about ma- managing anticoagulation. But are there anything special um, that you start thinking about when the patient comes into pregnancy or their preconception visit already on um, a warfarin or a, a DOAC? Yes. So kind of big, big takeaways or big things to remember. So DOAX cannot be used in pregnancy or breastfeeding. There's not safety data for those. So we have to stop those or or look for alternative anticoagulation strategies. 
warfarin. So if someone is already on warfarin for an an indication, the first thing I look at is the dose. So um, to help me better counsel the patient and it's important to remember um, this is a this is a big discussion with the patient, but for me coming into as a cardiologist, I think about the dose. So warfarin dose of five milligrams or less per day can be considered to continue through the first trimester. There's less fetal risk. It's not zero, um, but felt to be lower risk for embryopathy and other fetal complications. If the dose is five milligrams or more per day, they definitely need to be transitioned to uh, low, mo- uh, low Venox or low molecular weight heparin in the first trimester. And then potentially they could, uh, if they desire, could go back to warfarin in their second and third trimester. Um, so that's the that's one of the first things I look at to help me counsel mm-hmm. patients about options. Yeah. So we, we, we've all been taught that if you've got MR or TR or AR, you're going to be probably fine. You got to be watched a little bit, but I, I suspect that's not. I mean, we know that it is the lower, you know, mm-hmm. vascular resistance does sort of potentiate that. But what do we need to watch out for in those with regurgitant lesions? Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Generally speaking, regurgitant lesions have almost been, you know, lower risk might need to see us periodically, but there is some newer data that shows us that there is likely a subset of these patients that is indeed higher risk. And so again, if they know, if we know about the valve lesion, we should talk with them before pregnancy and things I look for. And what has been shown in um, a study is um, any history of cardiac events. So history of clinical heart failure history of um, LV, if their LV systolic function is reduced, or if they have any evidence of pulmonary hypertension with, you know, first say with their mitral regurgitation. That subset of though that group of patients with regurgitant lesions did in one study have a higher rate of cardiac events, almost 32% compared to 6% in those without those uh, uh, history pieces. So there very likely is a higher risk group of individuals with regurgitant valve lesions that we may actually say we might want to intervene on this, depending on what that might look like for the patient before a pregnancy. So, you know, I I think um, one thing we haven't touched, we've talked talked about the mom and we've talked about her risk, but there are two patients here. And yes. particularly in that late second, early uh, um, at, at through the third trimester where um, baby is viable. And um, and that's a lot of times, particularly for the stenotic lesions that we start seeing more problems. Yeah. Uh, talk about how you have interacted and in maybe best practices for that cardio OB pregnancy heart team, whatever we're going to call it, yep. um, to, to, to make decisions considering both patients. Yeah, you're, yes, absolutely. And, and part of the count, so I'm going to, I'm going to go back to preconception counseling, but again, when, when I do preconception counseling, it's not only important you know, to hear, we review the cardiac disease and again, effects for mom, but that they meet with maternal fetal medicine as well. I think that that should be a joint discussion and so that they can hear about their risk of things like preterm delivery, um, preeclampsia, because uh, these are going to be a higher risk patient population for hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And so um, then through pregnancy, when I'm seeing them, I I really try and we try and coordinate along with MFM and with our obstetric colleagues. And, you know, if I have a concern, I raise a concern or if they have a concern. And it's really a, having that collaborative practice is extremely important particularly if someone, a patient is not doing well and we need to consider, you know, do we need to do an intervention during the pregnancy? Do we need to do an earlier delivery? What does that look like for the baby and for the, for the patient, for the mom? Um, so it's really important to have a collaborative practice um, and have open communication uh, with both groups because it really takes a team to take care of both patients. Exactly. So um, I think we're paying a whole lot more attention to this topic. Um, do you, 
is there anything you see either short term or long term that's going to um, really help us and care for this or, or, you know, whether it's medication or practices or whatever. I mean, what's kind of the future for helping these moms and their babies? Yeah, I think there's a few things. So I think within cardiology, I feel that I have the most impact with before pregnancy. So preconception counseling. So I think recognizing when we have a younger patient that has cardiac disease that we know about is getting them to some uh, and someone or a practice that would provide counseling for them on what to expect and what pregnancy looks like. And I think that's a big opportunity for us in cardiology. Um, Also, I think to... um, as we talked about, disease can unmask in pregnancy. And through pregnancy, women are at increased risk for other things like periperm cribmapathy, SCAD, aortic dissection. And all of this can be common in the early postpartum timeframe as well. And so I think uh, improving the awareness within the general medical community and making sure we are appropriately investigating symptoms for patients is important. And then improving that care in the fourth trimester, I think, is also very important for, for, for women overall. So, so for those of whom the fourth trimester concept is not familiar, you want to just expand on that. Um, yes. I think we'll leave it with that, but there's been a lot of talk both in coverage of insurance for people who, do, mm-hmm. who, uh, for, for moms at, who depend upon say Medicaid, yeah. uh, and and you take away their healthcare once that baby's delivered or their insurance. So I talk about what it is and why it's so important. And we'll kind of end on that one. Yes. The fourth trimester. The fourth trimester. So it's the fourth trimester is just so obviously pregnancy has the three trimesters. Um, but the fourth trimester is really highlighting that immediate postpartum time frame, that several weeks postpartum where um, mom is still undergoing a lot of changes. So the delivery is an additional stress to the body. And it does take about eight to 12 weeks for all these physiologic and hormonal changes to really come back to normal or their baseline. And so the, there is a lot of changes that are still happening. And so women with known cardiac disease, that's we like to see everyone back within that time frame. So someone with a valve lesion or other cardiac disease aortopathy, uh, cardiomyopathy, we like to see them back within that fourth trimester, that like six to eight weeks postpartum, reassess things, repeat the echo. Um, But that also may need to be sooner depending, you know, did they develop hypertension in pregnancy? Did they have preeclampsia? And it's opportunities to improve blood pressure control, help support them emotionally, and make sure that they're tolerating this kind of change back to normal hemodynamics. Thank you, Katie, for uh, showing that, because I think that um, that is a relatively newer concept in terms of the care of women. um, And I think a really important one as we move forward, if we're going to make a difference both from a cardiovascular disease, but just a maternal health. um, Absolutely. Right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Um, This wraps up. Um, this week's episode of Interviews with the Experts. And I'd like to thank Dr. Young for joining me today and discussing this important topic. Thank you very much. Great to be here today. We look forward to all of you joining us next week for another Interview with the Expert. Be well.